All right. Good evening. I'm Reverend Steve Clegg, and I'm the interim pastor at Second Baptist Church. This is our midweek Bible study. We're almost to the end of Zechariah, so if you'll be turning to Zechariah chapter 12, we're going to be doing a little bit of jumping around this evening, um, as the last three chapters have kind of jump. so we'll just kind of work through this as we go through. But before we get there, um, let's go through our prayer requests and our announcements. Sunday School, 9 a.m., um, then at 10 a.m. is our morning worship service. Um, we also are doing the um, broadcast on 87.9 in the parking lot. If you're feeling more comfortable there, some people are not feeling well. Rather than coming in um, inside for the service or sitting in the parking lot, others just feel more comfortable out there, and that's fine. Um, we're just glad they come and worship and whatever works for them. Um, this past Sunday was our um, Mother's Day offering, the last Sunday for the month of May. Um, so those numbers will be coming out um, next week. Um, then also remember the food pantry sponsored by the Methodist Church. And then this week um, we had no birthdays or anniversaries listed. So um, with that, let's look at our prayer request. Um, Marianne Edwards, Jada Clayton, Karen Clayton. Karen will have to do some scans once they get those scheduled. Um, Jada will be going off to her training um, coming up shortly, so keep her in prayers. David and Connie Warren, Matthew Ward, Mac McMorrow, Shannon Daryl Brick, Chloe Akers, Janet House. Just remember special prayers for Janet. Have a really rough time. Um, Billy McKenzie, Linda and Cornelius Hunt, the Frisch family, Kyle Edwards, Taylor Fields, Ashley Blanks, Lee Stevens, Cynthia McMorrow and family, um, Ashley and Zaley and Inman, um, Paulette Faison, BJ Norris, Tommy Eford, Rosemary Taylor, Louise and Ron Rising, Melody Oakley. Jennifer Milligan, Sheila Milligan, Hunter Kinlaw, Michael Davis, Jim Miss Kelly, Ruby Johnson, Cheryl Barker, Kathy Beanie, Ronnie King, Barbara Walters. Remember Miss Barbara, um, she woke up and couldn't see. Um, don't, haven't had any updates on her, but definitely something going on with Miss Barbara's eyes. Um, Patricia Clayton, Helen Rogers, Frederica Aswell, Liliana Brutus and family, um, Mary Beard, um, our school systems, and the end of school was coming up for the children, so remember those things. Um, pulpit committee, church, laws, nation, its leaders, troops and their families, police officers, and then the pastors and their families. Um, added to that on the list, um, member Bethany Hooker. Um, then also traveling mercies as we just come through Memorial Day weekend. A lot of people have been traveling and all. Pray to everybody goes well. I understand they had a Pretty rough ride on one of the cruise ships coming into Charleston. Um, back from, I believe, the Bahamas. They had a pretty rough ride coming back in as they had a bad front. Um, remember Miss Patsy? Um, was a little bit under the weather. Um, the family of Ginger Cummings, who was um, killed in an auto accident. Um, then also, um, Donna Jarvis's grandbaby, Aviana, um, 9 pounds, 7 ounces. Um, so we congratulate them and that family. Um, but do remember the baby, they do want to take some pictures of the spine. So, like I say, just want to follow up on some things there. And then also, Tammy Williamson um, taking care of some things this week. So, a lot going on. Um, like I say, we just came through a holiday weekend. Um, so, remember, everyone is traveling. Um, a lot of violence in the news, um, as I was reading headlines from the weekend. A lot of violence across the country. Um, so like I say, we just need to be praying. Um, with that, like I say, it's the end of the school years. Remember the children, um, as they're getting ready to do their integrated testing. Some have already in, into it. It depends on what county. Some are already coming out. Graduations are going on. So a lot of different things going on with that as well. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you and give you the praise. And Father, we just pray that you'll just bless us and keep us. And Father, we thank you for the rains. Father, they are much needed. It's, it's early in the year and the crops are needing the water to grow. And Father, we just thank you uh, for the rains. And Father, we just praise you and give you the glory. And thank you for your watching hand over us, Lord, and over our families. And Father, we just ask you to continue to bless us and guide us. And Father, we lift up those on our prayer list. We have many on our prayer list are in need of special prayers. And Father, we have those who have upcoming procedures and um, tests coming up, and Father, just pray that you'll be with them as they go through them. Lord, you already know the outcome, and you've already prepared the way for them. Lord, we just pray to hold on to you. And Father, we're praying for good results and answers. And Father, we pray for those families who lost loved ones. 
unexpectedly. It's never easy, Lord. And Father, we just pray that you'll bless those families as they go through this time and help them. And Father, we give you the praise for those who have already overcome surgery and you're healing them. And they're getting stronger each and every day and their procedures are healing and going through treatments and getting stronger. And Father, we praise you for the birth of Aviana. And Father, it's just a wonderful time. And all we need to just make sure we list the good things, Lord. So often we're quick to ask, but we're so seldom do we give you the praise and the thanks. And Father, we just thank you for these things. And Father, we just pray for those who are shut in. Father, we know that they're faithful to us and their prayers are lifted up our way and we're praying for them, Lord. And Father, watch over them and keep them in their situations. And may they never feel alone. May they always feel your presence upon them. And Father, we just pray for the many different needs within the church and extended church families. And Father, there's those who are battling cancer, others who are battling breathing issues and heart disease and diabetes. And Father, the list goes on and just reminds us how frail these bodies are, but also how well that you've made them that they can overcome so much as you've been able to bless so many with healing, Lord. And Father, we just pray. We pray for our nation. We pray for our nation to be healed, Lord. We pray for the people to turn to you. And Father, we just ask you to just bless our nation. Guide it and direct it, Lord. Guide and direct our leaders. May they work together for the good of all and not bicker and fight and their own agendas. And Father, we just pray that our nation can be strong and under you, Lord. That we can be a nation under God. And Father, we pray for our children, for the future of our nation. We see so much in the news about them. And Father, we just pray that you'll bless them and guide them and send them those who can help them walk on the right way, Lord. As so many are getting out of control and going different paths. And it's because of peer pressure. It's because of the different things and lack of direction. Father, there's just so many things pushing upon our children. And Father, we just pray that you'll put your hand upon them. That you'll hold them tight and take care of them, Lord. And Father, we pray for our military. Father, we have many that are serving overseas and home and different places. And Father, we pray for their safety and we pray for their safe homecoming. If they're away from their family and friends. And Father, may they come home safe and secure. And Father, we pray, pray for our police officers, our first responders, our firefighters, ambulance, all those who rush in while others run away. Protect and keep them each and every day, Lord. And guide them and may they make wise decisions and do the things that are best. To do the things that you would have them to do, Lord. Bless them and keep them, Lord. And Father, watch over those who are out there working on the highways and byways. And Father, we have a great many in our area right now. There's a great deal of construction on our roads around us. And Father, protect and keep them. And Father, we pray for the travelers. We especially think of it during this time of holidays. We've just come through a holiday weekend and people are traveling. And some are starting their summer vacations and different things. And Father, we just pray for safe travels for everyone. And Father, we pray for the church. We pray, Lord, for the church to grow. We pray for its members to reach out. To tell others about Jesus. To, to reach out and to invite people. And Father, for the church to be alive. As it was that morning when Peter was preaching. And 3,000 were added and the numbers increased daily. May the church be alive and vibrant. That it will draw people to it. But also that it will go out and reach those who are lost. Father bless all that we do. We give you the glory and the praise. Which in the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Alright. Like I say. Um, be turning um, to Zechariah chapter um, 12. We're going to be doing a little bit of jumping around. Um. I apologize, I got on a little bit late this evening. I had to go do a little bit of community service. 
Um, I got a phone call this afternoon. Um, there are some bees in downtown St. Paul's. Um, some of you may not have known it, but um, they're hanging on a sign downtown um, up by um, Ta Ivy's Tax Center. And um, so I had to go and collect them this, this evening um, after work, um, get them out of the way. So that put me a little bit behind. I only got stone ones, just on the arm. Um, how they got me through the suit, I don't know, but they do. Um, but like I say, they're collected and hopefully they'll not bother anybody. Um, like I say, this evening we're getting to the ends of Zechariah. Um, and in order to stay with the topic, it kind of bounces through the last three chapters. It requires us to move around a little bit um, rather than following our verse by verse like we normally do. Um, for clarity's sake and trying not to repeat, we'll come off topic um, and touched on the last chapters and we'll follow the breadcrumb trail. Maybe that's a better way of putting it. It kind of bounces. Um, and then we'll come back and cover the other topics that we kind of touch on, but we'll kind of try to s clarify it. I mean, it's one reason why I've always kind of struggled doing Bible studies and Proverbs because Proverbs doesn't flow. Proverbs bounces. They're statements of wisdom. They're statements of different things. And um, it makes it a hard study in Proverbs when you do that, but we'll do one one day. I'm sure we will. Um, in the second section of Zechariah, um, we're going. Zechariah is going to give us some images of the end times, and a lot of times we talk about the end times, and we talk about revelations and some things that Jesus said while he was here and whatnot, and we forget that so much was said about the end times. In the Old Testament, now a lot of the end time stuff that's in the Old Testament deals particularly with the Jews, but at the same time, it still tells us things that are going on, and I think we got to be attuned to that because, like I say, these are things that help us to understand the way that the Lord's going to work in the end days. A key phrase in this is "in that day," which is also the day of the Lord. So we're going to see those. Um, and we're going to see how this kind of all melds together as I was preparing this study. It's an interesting um, way that it comes together. Um, this day being the day of wrath and judgment written by the prophets Joel and Zephaniah, Jesus spoke, as well as in John and Revelation. We get a lot of different pieces. Um, and like I say, this day is a phrase. Um, again, we're not going to get a complete picture of the end times. We're not going to get a complete, but we're going to get more and more um, images of it. Um, that hopefully we'll piece and draw from it as we go through these last three chapters. So we're going to start off with Zechariah 12, 1 through 3, and then we're going to jump to 14 um, and hit 1 through 7. Um, so the burden of the word, the burden of the word of the Lord of Israel saith the Lord, which stretcheth forth the heavens and layeth the foundation of the earth and formeth the spirit of man within him. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about. When they shall be in the siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. And in that day I will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces. Though the, all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. Then over in chapter 14. Behold the day of the Lord cometh. And thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For... I will cause all the nations in uh, all the nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravaged, and half the city shall go forth into captivity, and the rest of the people shall be cut off from the city. Now I'm going to stop there, and then we'll jump back in. In this, we're seeing two references to who is coming against Israel: all the people round about them, and all nations. This is the battle of Armageddon. The gathering of the people against Israel. Now there are three forces at work here that gathering the people. One, the nations agree to fight against Israel. So man is one force. Man is drawing together saying we need to go up against Israel. Satan is using his evil influence to gather people against Israel. So Satan's at play here. He wants to destroy Israel and God's people. And third, even God is using his power to gather the people against Israel. And you say, well, why would God do that? Well, God's going to demonstrate how great he is. Now, 
The term a cup is used to describe Israel's situation. Now a cup in a biblical image for judgment as well as a stone. Now the problem is God is not ready to give up entirely on Israel. There's different judgments that come upon Israel, but God is not given up entirely on Israel. Now the nations around them and their nations are ready to drink from that cup of Israel. Judgment they're going to take from it. Um, but the contents will make them sick. So it's not such a great drink, right? And history tells us that every nation that has tried to destroy the Jews has been destroyed themselves. It will be no different this time. Now during the battle, some of the enemy will enter into the city to loot it and abuse the women and take and, um, and take half of the residents captive. But the destruction of Jerusalem will not occur for this rock, this burdensome rock will not only cause issues for the invaders, but ultimately it will cut the invaders to pieces. That's what it said in 12.3. They may think they're having some success, but it's ultimately going to come back and bite them. Then the Lord appears. So let's look at verses 3-7. through seven. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof towards the east and towards the west, and there shall be a great valley. Half of the mountain shall move towards the north and half towards the south. And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azal. Yea, ye shall flee, like ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. And the Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with thee. And it shall come to pass in that day that the light shall not be clear nor dark, but it shall be one day which shall be known to the, day, to the Lord, not day, not night, but it shall come to pass that at evening time it shall be light. Now, things are looking bleak. And then all of a sudden the Lord appears on the scene. You know, the invaders are in the sea. They're starting to take off. And then God, the Lord shows up. When the Lord arrives on scene, several things happen this day. Keep in mind, Zechariah is talking to the Jews. Look at it from their perspective. We see him go into battle, but when he steps down on the Mount of Olives, the mountain splits from east to west, meaning, okay, horizontally, if you want to use a term. And we know this because it says half of the mountain goes north and half goes south, so that makes it like an equator line. So the mountain splits in two and creates a valley. That valley is the Lord's provision to the people of Jerusalem to escape. He's not given up on them yet. It is also referenced elsewhere in scripture, and if you put it on a map with some visuals, you get an interesting picture of Israel in the end times. The key point of this section is that the Lord will go into battle against the enemies. Many people today have written the Lord off as a warrior in search of peace. They have compromised and removed the words of songs from hymns that discuss this. The Jews in Deuteronomy 15, 1 through 21, sang to God after being delivered from Egypt that the Lord is a man of war. God is a loving God, but don't see him in only one light. This is the problem with a lot of people when it comes to Jesus and God. They make them fit what they want. They want a loving God, then that's all they teach about is a loving God. And so they get a very, what we call charismatic or a feel-good type of church. Well, we have a loving God, a loving God, a loving God. And that's all they talk about. They never talk about the judgment. They never talk about the wrath. They never touch, they talk about the anger of God. It's all about a loving God. None of us are single-faceted. We all have love within us, we have anger within us, we have joy, we have sadness, we have many angles about us. We are creating God's image, so why do we try to make God one facet? You have those who go all the way over and say God is a loving God, and you'll have those who go over and say God's a wrath because they're looking for the judgment to come in. They're trying to preach the judgment, and that's all they preach is the judgment, is the judgment and that wrath of God. 
And what happens is you get people that don't have a complete image of God. You know, you, I think of my father. My father was a good man. He was human. He had his faults, just like we all do. But he was a loving father. He was a caring father. He was a providing father. But he was also a, God, a father who would put out judgment, who would punish. So when we talk about God, there's a good reason that the Bible uses images like father. Because there's many avenues and many things that the father does for the family and to the individuals within the family. He leads, but he also serves. He blesses, but he also takes away. I mean, there's so much. And we have to understand that. And so Israel was saying that God was a God of war. That was because they were so excited about God defeating Egypt. And they're thinking, we have a God of war. But they had more than that. And they'll learn that. Like I say, God's a loving God, but don't see him in one light. He's a God of peace, he's a God of wrath, a God of mercy, a God of truth, a God of justice. You, you can't just pick part of God and what you want. That's sort of like what a lot of people do with their Bible. They take out everything out of the Bible they don't like or don't want to hear about and everything. And then whatever that's left is what they believe. I had a gentleman tell me that a lady in their church went on and on about how only the red letters matter in the Bible. True, in a red letter edition Bible, those are the words of Christ. But there's a lot of things in there about God sending messages through the prophets and other things that we should be listening to too. Matter of fact, there's not a bit of the scriptures that we shouldn't listen to. It is given to us as a complete work to help us. But the thing that I want us to see is that we have to see a bigger God. Not this God we have in a box that serves our needs and takes care of what we want and we control. I'm talking about the God of the universe. I'm talking about what is beyond our comprehension. It is that God who sent Jesus, the Lord, to step down upon the Mount of Olives and the mountain split when he stepped on it to the north and to the south and created a valley and the people run through and escape. And it is the Lord that's going to fight for Israel. But I want us to understand that he'll fight for us too. He's just not fighting for his people Israel, but he's fighting for the church as well. And we each individually make up the church. The question is, do you want him to? It's easy to say yes, but when it comes, when in a fight comes, will you stand with the Lord or will you run? Sometimes a fight comes to you and you have to decide if you want to stand or run. And if you're fighting with the Lord, you got to stand your ground. So to stand with the Lord, you have to walk with him daily. You got to be strong. You got to have a reliance on him. You got to have a trust. See, I'm not going to go into battle with somebody I don't trust that has my back. That's when, when the military, they train them in platoons and groups and divisions. and you, So that they're we're used to working together, that they know that that guy standing next to them has got their back. And they're going to work together. We need to have that. We are with the Lord. And we need to have that trust. Him, not just for battling, but for everyday issues and everyday problems and situations. If you hear the dog, the dog stirred up about something. Don't know what. Um, but like I say, I want us to see God in a full picture. We want to see the Lord Jesus because Jesus is our brother. We're co-heirs with Christ. He's our Savior, he's our Lord, but also he's our co-heir. But God is going to fight for Israel, he'll fight for us. To stand with us, we have to stand with him. And we have to follow the direction he gives us. Now, we're going to jump back to Zechariah chapter 12, verses 4 through 9. And in that day, saith the Lord, I will smite every horse with astonishment, and his rider with madness, and I will open mine eyes upon the house of Judah, and will smite every horse of the people with blindness. And the governors of Judah shall say in the heart, the inhabitants of Jerusalem shall be my strength, and the Lord of hosts their God. And in that day, I will make the governors of Judah like the heart of fire upon, around the wood, and like a torch of fire in a sheath, and they shall devour all the people round about, on the right hand and on the left. 
and Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, even in Jerusalem. The Lord also shall save the tents of Judah first, that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem do not magnify themselves against Judah. In that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and he that is feeble among them at that day shall be as David, and the house of David shall be as God, as the angel of the Lord before them. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Now to get to Jerusalem, the invaders have to go through Judah. Remember, you got Jerusalem and Judah around it, right? And God does something special in Judah for the sake of David and the promises that he made. God has not taken his word back from David. In the place that David held in God's heart, it makes a difference. And the interesting thing is it makes a difference thousands of years later after David is gone. And it's going to impact the lives of thousands of people. Judah is strengthened and encouraged by faith and the courage of the people in Jerusalem. Now imagine this. The weakest warrior of Judah will be as David. And remember the songs when they're talking about David? Saul has killed his thousands, but David has killed his tens of thousands. David in his prime was a great warrior. Though outnumbered, they will not be outdone. Remember, Scripture says that when the people are following God, and when they're walking, one person will out, you know, ten, a hundred will do thousands. You know, the magnitude of what the people will do will be greatly magnified by what God blesses them with. You may come against Israel with thousands, and God's hundreds will defeat them easily. Because the power of the God is with them. Why did David conquer? Because God was with him. David couldn't lose when he was with God. He expanded the kingdom of Israel to great size. By the time he had handed it over to Saul, the, or Solomon, the battles basically were over. The expansion was done in so many ways, and those that David had defeated were paying homage and bringing gifts to Israel, much of which David laid back for the temple. You go and read about what David laid back for the temple of God. It is amazing. So that when he talked to Solomon and told him about the temple and what he had to do, David had so much wealth laid up and provisions for it, timbers and iron and brass and gold and silver. All these things were laid up, ready for Solomon to build a temple. What has to happen for us to conquer our enemies? That's around the church. There are enemies around the church. A lot of people think, well, we come to church, there's no big deal. No. The church is under attack in many different ways. And in order for us to conquer the enemies, we need to be praying. We need to be walking where God walks. That's why, you know, it is so important for us to get in the scripture and have a hunger for the word of God. You can't walk where God walks if you don't know where he's walking. And you're not going to know it unless you know God and understand his ways and that you're in his word and so that he can speak to you through his word. Is where you're walking where God's walking? That's a question you have to ask. Is where you're going where God's going? Or are you going somewhere hoping God will follow? Big difference. The church can do anything God wants it to. God can enable our church to do these great and wonderful things if we will just walk with him. The question is, do you believe it? Do you have the faith to b believe it? Do you have the faith to put your feet where your faith is? That's always an interesting question. The next thing that says, Lord cleanses Israel. Zechariah 12, verses 10 through 
12. Uh, we'll just read these few. And I'll pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications. And they will look upon me in whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. In that day there shall be a great mourning in Jerusalem as a mourning of Hadadrinim in the valley of Megiddo. And the land shall mourn every family apart, and the family of the house of David apart, and their wives apart, and the family of the house of Nathan apart, and their wives apart. What do we see in here? They're mourning for Jesus. Israel is mourning for Jesus. Not only the man they killed, but as a son. Remember, he's a descendant of David. He is the king. He is a son of the house of David, and they killed him. And not only do the families mourn, but the land mourn. Everything is mourning. And out of this mourning for the killing of Jesus, the nation enters into repentance. They saw their sin. They saw their wrongdoing. And they enter into repentance. Not just a few, but a national repentance has never been seen before. Pentecost will not hold a candle to this revival. And we talk about Pentecost as the birth of the church. But we're talking about a national repentance. When the people truly repent, truly mourn the death of Christ, they will come face to face with what they've done and cannot help but change. It is at that point they'll recognize that Jesus was the Son of God. that they had killed their Messiah. And with that, they cannot help but to be changed. We're over 2,000 years later after the death of Christ, a man that they've not even met, one day they rejected for 2,000 years, but by our power of God, they're going to realize as a nation, and it tears them apart. It brings them to their knees in mourning. How God will do that, I do not understand. I know he can do it. But they're going to realize it. Question. How many Christians fail to realize what they have done and have never truly mourned the death of Jesus? See, it's one thing to repent, but you have you ever mourned the death of Jesus? Have you ever mourned and said, you know, my sins put him there. I'm the reason that Jesus went to the cross. If nobody else had sinned, he would have went to the cross just for you. Grown men and women cry, but more importantly, they mourn. There's a difference between crying and mourning. There is a season to mourn and there's a season to rejoice. We understand that from Ecclesiastes, right? But before we rejoice, let's be sure that we mourn appropriately. Once we mourn the death of Christ, we should be grieved by those around us who have lost and dead in the Lord. See, when we mourn the death of Jesus and understand the death of Jesus, then when we look around and we see those who are lost, we realize it is for them that he has died as well as us. And we should be grieved that they have not accepted the gift that Jesus gave them through his death. We should be moved. We should be moved to reach the lost. But if we do not mourn the death of Jesus, then we're taking our salvation for granted. Do you understand your part in putting Jesus on that cross? See, it is our grief and mourning and repentance that should motivate us to do something 
rather than say it can't be done. See, a lot of people say, oh, it can't be. The world has changed. Nobody wants to worship. Nobody wants to talk about Jesus. No, that's our excuse in order not to do what we're supposed to be doing. If we had mourned the death of Jesus and truly have gone through that process, we will be grieved to see those who are lost and will do everything we can to reach them with the gospel. Our mourning will become a motivator. Now remember, David and Goliath. David was not expected to win. Look, he walked out there. He didn't even wear any armor because Saul's armor was too big for him. He didn't even have armor. He walks out there with a sling and five stones. And probably whatever his little shepherd knife was that he had carried with him. But, you know, He was not arrayed for battle. But he did. And I never made the connection until years later when somebody made the connection for me. They said, why did, why did David carry five stones? Because a shepherd, if they were good, would hit their target on the first shot. And David had many, much time to practice when he was out tending the flocks because being the youngest, they put him out there. Matter of fact, that's where he was when Samuel came to anoint him. He was out tending the flocks because they thought that that's where he needed to be. Goliath had brothers. All told, there was five between Goliath and his brothers from what I understand from the scriptures. Maybe David thought Goliath's brothers were coming to save him once he killed him. Who knows? But the thing of it is, David wasn't expected to win, and he did. The church is not expected to win in this world, but yet it can if we will follow Jesus. If we will walk with God and do his will and do the things, the church can be victorious. But it will not be if we do not have faith and we have not mourned the, Christ, the death of Christ and are not motivated to reach the lost. That's an interesting place to stop. What is the church going to do? We can't answer for all the other churches. We can't say that, oh, they're going to do this and they're going to... No. The only person we truly can answer for is ourselves. And each self within our church makes up the body of the church. So before you worry about what this person decides or that person decides, what are you going to decide? Are you going to mourn the death of Jesus and allow that grief and mourning to motivate you to reach the lost? Or are you going to take your salvation for granted and not worry about others? We can be a church victorious or we can be a church going to its grave in one generation. That's a cold hard fact. That decision is up to each and every individual within the church. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, you give us a lot to think about. Father, you give us a lot to look at. Father, may we mourn. May we grieve the death of Jesus. We can rejoice in the victory of his death, of his victory over the death and his raising from the grave. We can do that. But Lord, we put him there. If no one in the world sinned but us, he would have gone to that cross. We're guilty. May our hearts mourn and be grieved by this. And may it turn us so that when we look at others who are lost, we'll say, they're squandering the death of Jesus. I must help them find Jesus. That my Savior's death be not in vain for so many. 
Father, bless us, move us, guide us. May our feet be fast to move according to your word and to the direction that you'd have us to go. For it's in the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. God bless and have a good evening.